September 23rd, 2021, 4.59 p.m. And I'm going to, have to cover no uniform circular motion. Okay, so in the case of no uniform circular motion, we still have a centripetal acceleration. But in addition to the centripetal acceleration, we are going to have a tangential component of the acceleration. Okay, so two components, centripetal and tangential. And that is the polar coordinate system, okay? That's how we are displaying this, this acceleration vector in terms of a radial component and in terms of a tangential component, which is, you know, which has to do, which is related to the polar coordinate system. When you sum those two components, you get something like that. Remember that I told you that component of the acceleration is still towards the center, towards the center of the curvature, right? It's still towards the center of the curvature, but because we have a tangential component, it is twisted a little bit to the other side. Okay? It is possible to have something like that. When you have something like that, the velocity vector that you see right here is going to increase in magnitude. See that? The increase in magnitude of the velocity vector. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, and by the way, when the velocity vector increases, the centripetal acceleration increases too, right? Not necessarily the, tang the tangential acceleration may not increase. It's all going to depend on the type of uh, acceleration that you have. If the tangential acceleration is, is, is constant, okay, it's, uh, this one may, might not uh, change. But the centripetal acceleration will change. If you do have a tangential component, the centripetal acceleration will change no matter what. Right? Because the velocity is changing. And the centripetal acceleration depends on the velocity, right? That's why I drew like that. In this case, we have a tangential acceleration, a component of the tangential acceleration that's increasing the velocity. We could have the other way too. We could have the tangential acceleration. This is decreasing the, the speed of the of the particle. In this case, the centripetal acceleration would decrease. Okay, so here you go. Oh, here you go. That I have that for you. See, the tangential component now is contrary to the velocity vector. That's another example, right? So let me see. Oh, I made some mistake here. Yeah, I increased the size, right? Let me fix that for you. Yeah. If the velocity is decreasing, the centripetal acceleration should decrease as well. Okay, so let me fix that. Okay, since I am here. Oh, let's see here. Yeah. This one. Right, we have a tangential component. The tangential component should not change. So I'm going to shrink this guy a little bit. Let's say the tangential component is constant. Okay. The centripetal acceleration, the velocity is decreasing. Let's see. It's a little bit longer than that, right? Here you go. Here you go. Maybe it's like that. The centripetal component of the acceleration should be decreasing. In this special case, let's see if it's smaller or not. Looks like smaller, right? The velocity vector is decreasing and the net acceleration vector should decrease. Okay, go. So the net acceleration vector, this component should be parallel to the tangential component. Let's see, this one's parallel. Yeah, a little, a little bit off, right? Let's align it a little bit. Okay, and 
and now I can have a more realistic net acceleration vector. Do you understand why the centripetal component changes in this case? Okay. Because the centripetal acceleration is v squared over r, right? Is uh, is circular motion. R doesn't change, but V is changing. But V is changing like that. And we have a, a homework problem in the homework for you to, for this specific case. Okay, so, so let's uh, uh, let's put that in the notes. Okay, go. No uniform circular motion. Okay. Circular motion means what does circular motion mean? Means that the magnitude of the radial vector is constant. Magnitude of the radial vector. It's constant. Uh, let's say not magnitude of the radial vector, but magnitude of the position vector is constant. Okay? Position, in this case, you know, the position vector coincides with the radiation, with the radial vector, coincides with the radial. It's constant. No uniform motion means we have an acceleration. A tangential, we have a tangential acceleration component. Tangential acceleration component. Component that is either parallel or anti-parallel anti to the velocity vector. Velocity vector. All right? Tangential acceleration. Tangential acceleration. Parallel to the velocity vector. What happens? The speed of the particle increases. Okay. Since the centripetal let us assume here go, let's put it this way, let us assume. that the tangential acceleration is constant. All right, just for the sake of discussion here. Remember, you, we don't want, uh, you know, the way we do it, we first study, we first study simpler pro problems, right? And little by little, we'll build up in, in the difficulty of the problem. Right, so we start with uniform circular motion, no tangential component of the acceleration. Next step, okay, no uniform circular motion, but the tangential component of the acceleration is constant. We keep it constant, right? And then we stop here. Tangential acceleration parallel to the velocity vector, the speed of the particle increases since the centripet, okay, increases. Since the Centripetal, centripetal acceleration depends on the speed and the radius of the circular trajectory, comma, the centripetal 
acceleration also increases. All right, here we go. Insert, let's go to our equations here. So whenever you're done with this physics course, you're gonna learn how to put equations of that true in Microsoft Word, right? Not just a physics course, it's a course on Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, and Excel. Here we go. Here we go a tangential, no, a centripetal. A centripetal, uh, if I'm writing here, this work is the component. Oh well, takes so long. Man, if we were doing that online, I would be doing that much quicker because I have a better computer there at home, you know. But we can't do the lecture online. What we cannot do is the lab online did you like the, the the online lectures during the pandemic did you folks like it or you didn't like it no i think it was too much of at the house oh <laughs> <laughs> because of that right what's that you didn't have a good computer set Uh -huh. You lose internet. Oh, and you have too many people there at home that. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, music. Oh gosh, anybody else? Anybody else want to share his <laughs> his experience? At your own pace. Pro, pro, provided you have the recording. Uh, yeah, on YouTube, right? Yeah. I, I like, I like, you know, because I don't have to drive half an hour here. I didn't have to drive half an hour here and a half an hour back. I liked it. And my computer is a joy to work with it, you know. I have two screens there. Maybe I'll buy a third one. <laughs> and a monitor. <laughs> yeah. It's really, really handy. Here you go. But, you know, that there's a problem. Right, many students don't have access to a good computer, right? I had students that they were following my, my lectures with their cell phone. How are they going to keep on zooming in and zooming out in the nose? It's terrible. I was tutoring a student last week, and she was doing that. I was doing private tutoring to a student there in the East Coast. She was doing that, a high school student. She was paying like $50 an hour for me, and she, you know, had to go back and forth. She was a smart student, but... Why are you using a cell phone? You have to have your, no, you're at home, use your desktop, right? It's, uh, uh, it was very slow for her to, to keep up. Okay, so here you go. Since the centripetal force depends on the speed, okay, and, and the radius of the circular trajectory, the centripetal acceleration also increases, okay? In this case, you know, R is constant, but V increases. Consequently, the centripetal acceleration increases as well. Okay. And you may get into trouble, okay? If you are driving a car and you are increasing your speed in a curve. You may get into trouble because your car can handle up to a certain speed in a in a curve, okay, in a exit. We're gonna cover that as well, okay? Okay, what about tangential velocity? Let me see. In this case, right? Yeah, here you go. This one here? Yeah. Oh, okay. R is constant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, it's the keyboard, and then the computer is slow, too. I bought this computer when? 2019, maybe? I like it because it's very light, you know? 
Okay. The simulation also increases. Change of acceleration. Anti parallel. Anti parallel. To the velocity vector, the speed of the particle decreases. Since the centripetal acceleration depends on the speed, uh, the centripetal acceleration also decreases. Right? R constant, but V decreases. See equation above. Right? Above. In this case, R is constant, but V decreases. Consequently, the centripetal acceleration decreases as well. So here we go. So that's what we have for that. And now let's move on to the next topic. Which is very important. Here you go. That's the. That's how I denote the net acceleration, a centripetal component plus a tangential component. The centripetal component we already know that v square over r. What we do not know is the tangential component. Okay, but I can write that down as being the vdt. I can write that down, and I'm putting a theta hat here, which is the polar unit angle right by the same token that we have the unit angle along the x-axis and the unit angle along the y-axis we are going to also to have the unit angle along the r the radial direction and the unit angle along the angular direction okay let me copy this one and paste there in the notes here you go oh. Now, what you're going to do now is important concept. It's called relative motion. You have to learn that if you want to learn Einstein's theory of relativity. Okay? And also, if you are going to fly an airplane or fly a boat in a current, you know, that, uh, that has applications to that as well. Okay, relative motion is applicable to airplanes that fly out there, is applicable to boats that navigate in a current, either in a river or in the ocean. Okay, so how do you get that to understand that? Let's go. I prefer to take a look to show you here. Here you go, the PowerPoint. Let's see if I have it. Okay, so the way we study is it's like that, you know. We consider two referentials. The referential, we call it the referential A. Referential is just the X and Y axis, okay? Here you go. I'm going to put it thicker. We call it referential A. And let's say the referential A is the referential attached to the ground. Okay? I decide to do the referential XY, put here on the floor of this classroom. And then we have this referential B that is a moving referential. The referential B can be your, your car. Think about your car being the referential B, and you also put a X and Y axis in your car. Okay, that's what uh, I'm calling that X and Y. And to differentiate from the other, I call it X prime and Y prime. Okay, the referential B. C, B, and A. That's how you do things in physics. We do that also in, in theory of relativity as well. Consider two referentials. So if you want to understand theory of relativity, you have to know that. Okay, so here you go. 
And again, this referential is moving with respect to referential A. And here is my notation, impor important notation, very useful this notation. Velocity of referential B, okay, with respect to A. Make sense? Okay? The velocity of referential B with respect to referential A. So moving to the right. So here you go, we have this referential here. Uh -huh. The referential here in the classroom. I'm just going to demonstrate in the classroom, right? Suppose that we have a fixed x and y axis here, and I'm going to carry along my own referential x prime and y prime, right? I'm going to move at one meter per second in this direction. My referential here, okay? That's one meter per second would be my relative velocity with respect to that referential that stay there, that stay here in the ground. Make sense? By the same token that I have the velocity of B with respect to A. I can also say that that referential that the volume is at rest is that referential in my view, okay, according to my referential, is moving on the other direction. Velocity of A with respect to B. Make sense? Velocity of B with respect to A is to the right. The rest, velocity of A with respect to B is to the left. Make sense? Okay. So that's what, what Einstein meant when he said theory of relativity, okay? It depends, it's, re, it's relative to the referential. By the same token that I, the guy that has stayed in the ground can say that I'm moving away from him, I can also say that he is moving away from me, okay? That's what to end, there is a relationship. Vb of A is minus Va of B. Okay, if you change the referential. Let me see if I have a slide here. Uh, no, I don't have it. But anyway, here is the very generic way. And then I got to do something else here too. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to change the color of this guy. Uh, green. Let's see if it works. No, it didn't work. Bring to front, maybe. Or maybe it's too thin. Yeah, we cannot see it. Let's make it thicker. I can hardly see it. Oh, man. Let's go thicker than that. I wish PowerPoint was quicker than that. It takes so long to, to do certain things. In, ah, okay, now we're changing. Now you can see it. See that, the vector position? Okay, now not only we have relative velocity, but we also have relative position. Ref position of referential A with respect to B. See that, the vector? Now do you see why, why, why we have to stack vectors? Okay. And don't forget that what this red that you see is in reality the axis, right? It's the axis of the referential. Maybe I'm gonna just this, you know, place it slightly so you know that uh, it is there in the background. Okay. So what's happening? How how can you do this problem, right? What what type of problem can we do? Well. Suppose that we have a particle right in here. There is referential A, there is referential B, okay? One referential is moving with respect to the other one. And now they are both looking at the motion of a particle. Two referentials, one object moving, one particle moving. And this particle P has a velocity has a velocity, that's P, with respect to A. See that? And also, with respect to B, we also have the velocity of P with respect to B as well. I didn't put that. Okay, suppose that we know the velocity with respect to referential A. Find the velocity with respect to referential B. That's the type of thing that we do. So let me show you how we're going to do that. But before we go into the velocity, take a look at the vector's position here. Here you go. Here's the vector position of referential A with respect 
back to B. He, here is the position. I'm going to put in red color. Position of the particle with respect to referential B. Okay, and I'm going to write that down very soon. Hang in there. In the notes. And it has a very nice notation. When we use this notation here, it has a very nice equation. Okay, and we have this deposition vector of the particle P with respect to B. Okay, I'm going to put both face here. Take a look at this triangle here. One, two, and three. Do you see the triangle? RBA plus RPB is equal to RPA. See that? Make sense? Just by looking at the triangle, you know, this vector plus this vector is going to be equal to this vector. We're going to use that. We're going to use this knowledge. We're going to use this results. Let me write that down for you. And already have memorized because, you know, here you go. Um, relative motion. Okay, relative motion. Now, I'm going to tell you why is it important, right? Well, it's important for the, very, for the following reason. If you are an airplane pilot and you are flying out there in the sky, if there is no wind whatsoever, okay? There is no wind whatsoever, your ground speed is going to be the same as your air speed. Make sense? Air speed and ground speed, right? If there is a wind then your ground speed may not be the same as your air speed. And pilots have to do that only in the past. No, now we have GPS. But in the past, we, as a pilot, we had to do those calculations in the cockpit in real time to get to our destination. Don't think it's easy to navigate an airplane. Don't think it's easy to navigate a boat. It's easy to navigate the freeways because you have signs all over the place, right? But nobody puts signs there in the clouds for the pilot to go, right? You have to rely on instruments. Nowadays, we have GPS. It's much easier, right? But you still have to respect rules. Okay? It's just like the conversation I used to have uh, with this Brazilian brigadier. When I was an uh, undergraduate student like you, I was tutoring at his, his, his house there in Rio. It was, you know, I went to see his house there nearby the airport in Rio de Janeiro. And he has this little kid, you know, an old man. He, maybe he was in his 40s or 50s, okay? He had, he had a young wife, two kids, and he wanted me to tutor his kid. And he was telling me, you know, whenever... That, that was back in the 80s. Think about that. That was back in the 80s. The Brazilian Navy already had GPS in their, in their ships. He was telling me that, okay? But every now and then, they would lose the GPS signal. Because the system was not perfected at that time, right? Think about that in the 80s, 40 years ago. And so the, the brigadier, the brigadier, no, he's not the brigadier, man, what, what am I talking about? In the Navy, what's the highest uh, rank? What's the highest rank in the Navy? Come on, there's the brigadier, the Air Force, right? There is the general that is in the, the, in, in the Army, and then in the Navy is what? I forgot, what was the highest? Like a, a sergeant? Admiral. Admiral. admiral, yeah, Admiral. Just like Admiral Kirk. Okay, good, yeah. The Admiral, the guy was the Admiral, yeah. And he was telling me, you know, while we have the GPS working, we could navigate well during the high seas. But every now and then would lose, would lose the GPS signal, and then what happened? We are back to Christopher Columbo. We had to get, get our, you know, by the, go by the stars, you know, and do whatever, and the compass, and forget it. You know, go back to the 1500s to get to navigate in the, in the high seas. He was telling me all that stuff, okay? So, and that's where relative motion comes along. They had to know the, the, the velocity of the water current. They had to know the direction of the water current. They had to figure out what was the velocity of the ship with respect to the water and the velocity of the ship with respect to the continent to the ground okay to get to the right point right, right? 
think about that. They had to do all those calculations, even at 40 years ago. Imagine Columbus, Christopher Columbus, and the other navigators back in the 1500s. What they had to do with their small ships. Okay, that's why they wouldn't survive. Because it was something very difficult to do. And the story goes, the story goes that they would hire mathematicians in those ships to do the calculations in real, real time by hand. So they could get to the right spot. Okay? And they were all using relative motion. Do you get the idea? Okay? Exciting times, right? And then there were other problems too. They didn't have good good, good time pieces at the time. You know, they, they had they had compass, yeah, which was a great invention at the time. But uh, what about the time pieces? It took a long time for them to invent a good time piece, you know, a chronometer that would work reliably in a ship. Think about that, folks. You need not only a compass, but you need a time piece as well, a reliable time piece. Okay? When they invented the pendulum clock, it was a huge, it was a huge advancement. It was a huge, you know, kind of, it was 60 times better than any clock that was available at that time. But the pendulum clock had a problem. If you put a pendulum clock in a ship that could that would bounce back and forth in the waves, the clock would get out, out, out of synchrony. And they had to invent another type of pendulum clock that would work well in the ship. Do you get the idea? Okay. And the British managed to, managed to do that. That's why they became a superpower, right? But they were using all that relative motion. They had to have those clocks, they had to have the compass, and so on. So, so let's start with our calculations here, right? Going back to our, the, the starting point is this diagram that you see right in here. Here can be the ground, can be the continent that you want to get, or the continent that you left, right? Here can be the water current in the ocean, referential B. And P can be your ship, you know, Santa Maria or Pinta no? or Nina, Columbus Santa Maria, Columbus Santa Pinta or Nina. P would be one of those ships there. Okay, and they want the Columbus want to get to the other side of the con to the other side of the Atlantic. That was the Americas. He didn't know what what had in there. Poor Columbus, he died thinking that he had reached the Indies. He didn't. He never figured out that he reached the Americas. He never figured out he discovered a brand new continent. He died thinking that he arrived in the Indies, which was Eastern Asia. You know, people say Columbus uh, was was crazy man. Was you know, he looked like he had a mental problem because he died thinking that his contemporary said, "Look, man, you did far better than that. You discovered a brand new continent." Okay, think about the confusion of the time, right? So here you go. Let's go. Insert. Oops. The equation. And you're going to see it's very easy to memorize the, those vectorial equations. Don't forget, everything is going to be a vector r, right? You're going to have one vector r, another vector r, and a third vector r. They are all vectors. Oh boy. I wish I would be doing this one here. Take forever, but then they don't have the debut software. Come on, come on. 533. And on the top of that, my vision is not very good as it used to be. Must be which one? Is that the one? The arrow? No, that's not the arrow. Must be down. Oh, here you go. This one here. And things get even more complicated when you're talking about reaching Earth's orbit, okay? Now you have this rocket that's moving with respect to the ground. We have the Earth that's also rotating. 
Okay, think about that. All involve relative motion. And then when you're flying your spacecraft to the other to the other planet, then you have to change your referential from the Earth to the Sun. Okay? All involves relative motion. So here you go. I'm gonna give you let's see, let's start with this one here. R P sub A, right? The position of the particle P with respect to referential A. Gotta go back there to the drawing so you know what's gonna come next. I'm gonna change the subscript, don't worry. Okay, look at the subscript. Is equal to RBA, RPB. Okay, RBA plus RPB, right? RBA plus RPB. Like that. Okay. Do we believe this equation? Okay. And that's the equation that's going to reveal us something important. Okay. But the equation is still not in the intuitive format that I like. Okay. A better format, a better intuitive format. It's better because it's more intuitive. Is a format in which I commute this vector with this other one. So remember what those no this notation means. Position of particle P with respect to referential B. Position of particle P with respect to referential A. Okay? And position of referential B with respect to referential A. Why did I change my notation? There is a reason why I changed my notation. Do you see the reason? What's that? What is the reason? Look at the subscripts. In the first one, we have those subscripts here on the right side. Right? Here you go. PA, right? Equal to... B A P B, right? But just by commuting the two vectors, we get a different notation that's far more intuitive, makes it easier for you to memorize the equation. Do you see that? So you don't even have to do the drawing. Just remember this rule of thumb. See that? P is here. Right? P is the first one. P is the first one. P is the first one in the left. P is the first one in the right. A is the second one in the left. A is the last one in the right. And then what do we have in between here? We have index that are repeated. Can you memorize that easily? Easy, easy enough, right? And that applies not just to the vector positions, it also applies to the velocity, to relative velocity as well. Okay, and this notation also can be used to remember more easily the, transform the transformations that you're going to learn in Physics 39 that are the Lorentz transformation in special relativity. The same notation. Okay. Okay, now that, let's see, 538, right? Let's, now we can go to the next step. And by the way, you know, by the same token that we have something like that, this notation works in the other way too. Suppose I don't want to know the, relative, the position of particle P with respect to A, but I want to know the position of particle P with respect to referential B. How this thing is changed? How this equation is changed? You should know that now, right? 
you go. You change this like right that, like that. Oops, not this one. Make sense? Right? Those two equations, they are similar. They're not the same, but they're similar. Okay? Here you go. P, B, P, A, A, B. Okay, and I'm going to bold face that. There is more. There is more. Let me give you another example. Vector position of a particle P with respect to referential B is going to be equal to minus vector position of referential P B with respect to particle P. Does it make sense? There's a minus sign here. Okay, we can go back to our... Can you see that? Here you go. The vector position of particle P with respect to A, right? If you're going to do the vector position of the referential A with respect to particle B, the tail would be at P and the head would be at A and would be inverse of the vector. So this notation has mathematical properties. Okay? Provided, you know, you know what the, how the properties work, how the property works. So we can do the same here. Here you go. We can do. Remember that I told you that if I am the referential B, I actually see the the wall of this room moving on the other direction, right? So we have the same thing here. Here you go. Position of the referential A with respect to B is equal to minus the position of referential B with respect to A. Okay? How do you read it? I'm going to spell that out here for you. The above, because sometimes we forget how to read it, right? The above relation. Now, let's see. The vector on the right, left side of the above, the vector on the left side of the above relation can be read as vector here you go I'm gonna put between quotes vector position of Referential A with respect to referential B. Okay? That's how you read that. And then if you're going to do this one, all you have to do is exchange A by P, right? And so on. So it's 5.42. Let's have our break now. And then we continue this. With that, right? Let's see. I'm gonna come up with a. Did you get it? Okay. Okay. So it's a very simple way to, but it's hidden there, right? It's hidden there. I I don't see books, you know, talk about this this mathematical mathematical property of this notation. I don't have ever seen any books talking about that. We end up discovering it by ourselves. I'm gonna pause. Remember, remind me, remind me of. No, it's recording. Good. Okay, so let's start. Let's say, let's start with this one. Okay, we usually know the position of a part with respect to the fixed referential. We usually know that. Okay, so so let's use this one instead. And what's gonna be the next step? Now that we know the position with respect to the referentials, we can find out the velocity by differentiating both sides of the equation. Make sense? Okay. That's the equation. That is the equation of the position of the particle with 
with respect to referential B. Now, to referential B. Okay. If you know, if you want, if we want to know the velocity of the particle with respect to B, all we have to do, all we have to do is to differentiate the above equation. Differentiate. Okay, so go ahead, copy it. So apply the derivative to both sides. I'm gonna put it like that, you know, make it do it in the lazy way. And then we do it in the lazy way, here go. And right. And then we go ahead and expand that. Total derivative here, total derivative here, total derivative here. I will copy that. Here we go. And the notation doesn't change, right? What the notation that we had for the position, you know, is preserved for the velocity. And by the way, it's the same notation is preserved for the acceleration as well. Here you go, that's uh, now velocity V, right? Like that. Okay. P P B B A A. Okay, changing from A to B. That's what we're doing. Changing from referential A to B. And now we can come up with a Nice example. Example. Simple example you're going to see in your life. Simple example you're going to see. You're going to see in your life on relative motion. Relative motion. Okay. Don't do like that. Um, here you go. Uh, an airplane is flying north. Okay. In an airplane, you know, we have this instrument there in an airplane that we call airspeed indicator. Okay. 
airspeed indicator is nothing but not more than you know how do we call that thing that rotates when the wind comes through it turbine, huh? turbine? no they, they, i'm talking about the one that the kids play with they hold it and they start running and then start moving so an airspeed indicator is just like a pinwheel, works just like a pinwheel, okay? If there is no wind, it doesn't rotate, right? The wind starts blowing, what's going to happen? It's going to rotate faster and faster, right? That's what an airspeed indicator is all about. You know, airplanes have those, those instruments in there. It's a very simple instrument, and because it's very simple, it's very reliable too. If you're going to invent anything in your life, make sure it's simple. But it's not just necessary. It doesn't have to be only simple too. It has it has also to be non-obvious, okay? Because the simplest things are the most difficult to want to invent. Okay, the simplest devices are the most difficult ones to invent because people like to think very complicated. Okay, and not not only are more difficult to invent, but they're all they're also more difficult to discover, and they are also the most powerful ones as well. Okay, so that's what our airspeed indicator is. It's like a, thing, a pinwheel. So you put a pinwheel there in your airplane, and then you count the rotations of your pinwheel per second, and you display, you calibrate your rotations per second with the speed of the wind. Okay, people can do that in the lab, and then you display the airspeed, the velocity of the wind in your airspeed indicator. That's how people do. Okay? So, so we have those devices in, in the airplane, okay? The airspeed indicator, here you go. The airspeed indicator in the plane, you know, shows that the, the speed of the air, you know, shows uh, the speed indicator of the plane in the plane indicates indicates a speed of uh, let's see what's a good speed for an airplane while you're flying something like 120 knots 120 knots is 240 kilometers an hour 240 kilometers an hour you divide by 160 and then 1.6 and then you find out what's in miles, right? Let's see. Let's see if it's a reasonable speed. It is a reasonable speed for the airplane. 240 kilometers an hour is a reasonable speed for an airplane. Especially a small airplane. Okay, so... Uh, an air, uh, a ground station... A ground station... Has measured the wind at the altitude has measured the wind has measured the wind at the altitude with a balloon okay with a meteorological balloon moon and has reported that the wind is calm at that altitude. That's what we say in aviation. Wind calm. Okay? So the question is, what is the ground speed of the airplane? Okay? What's the ground speed of the airplane? Okay, solution. You gotta identify each one of the parameters, right? Let's say so. Let's say that a referential in the ground, b referential of the wind, and p is the airplane. So 
what do we know? Here you go. Uh, and now I'm not going to use this equation anymore. I'm going to use the other one, right? Because I want to find out the ground speed. I want to find the velocity of P with respect to A, right? Here you go. But, well, I still can use this equation. That's okay. I still can use this equation. Okay, yeah, I want to, here you go, I want to know that's, that's good, let's use this one. We're going to find out this one. The airplane. That's what we want to know. Okay. So, I told you that the wind is calm at the altitude of the airplane. What's going to be V of A with respect to B? What is the velocity of the ground with respect to the wind would be, be zero because wind is calm no wind is blowing right so wind calm means you know Vb is equal to vba which is equal to zero okay so now we can go ahead and substitute this. Like I said, this is the easiest example that I going to see. Then I'm going to talk about another one. Here you go. I'm going to. And then we conclude that the velocity of the airplane with respect to the ground is the velocity of the airplane with respect to the wind okay now let's go to the next one a more difficult one now have ever heard of that saying may you fly with tailwinds have ever heard that pilots usually say that may you fly with tailwinds when you board the airplane you no have never heard that well, no, not really. Think about that. May you fly with tailwind. There is tailwind and there is headwind. Think about that. What do you prefer to do with your bike? Do you prefer to bike with a headwind or you prefer to bike with a tailwind? tailwind. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So may you fly with tailwind. Eh? May you fly with tailwind. And do you know how long it takes to fly? from Los Angeles, the flight time from Los Angeles to New York. Do you have any idea? From Los Angeles to Miami, from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. Do you have any idea how long it takes? Yeah, something like that, four or five hours. What about the way back? Huh? What do you say? It's longer, right? At least one or two hours longer. Do you have any idea why? The prevailing winds in the altitude blows from the west to the east. Okay? Blows from the west to the east. So may you fly with tail winds, right? You're going to get there earlier. And that's how the wind prevails throughout the whole earth. Okay? At least in the northern hemisphere. I believe in the southern hemisphere is all the way around. Okay? So you're better off flying east than west. Okay, so here you go. Let's go to the next next level, right? Uh, an airplane flying north. Okay, the airspeed indicator of the airplane indicates 120 knots. A ground station has measured the wind at the altitude, the meteorological balloon, and has reported that the wind is... is blowing to the north at a speed of let's, let's put uh, 30 knots what's the ground speed of the airplane okay what's the ground speed of the airplane because I want to know the ground speed right I'm gonna change this notation here now Vp with respect to B is 
Okay, we go up. With respect to A. Now, what we do not know is this guy here, right? Let's do a drawing. Maybe we should be doing a drawing. Uh, let's see, airplane is flying. It's easier if I do here in the board. Airplane. Right? My north. Let's say y axis is north. Here is the wind. You know, velocity of B with respect to A. That's A. And uh, the way we do, we usually represent like that. We go to the That's the differential B. Right? The loss of B with respect to A, and that's the particle P. Okay, airplane there. Okay. And don't forget, it's air speed in the indicator. It's not air velocity indicator. Right? There's a difference here. The speed is one thing, velocity is something else. Right? The speed is the magnitude of the velocity. Right? So that's a, you know, the wording is correct. Okay, so here you go. How do we solve that? Velocity of the wind with respect. To the ground is 30 knots. Oops. 30 knots. Again, one knot. One knot is approximately 2 kilometers per hour. Approximately. Okay, and then you divide that by 1.6 to get that in miles per hour. Miles per hour. Okay, so the velocity of the airplane with respect to the wind should be the positive. Oh, and by the way, I gotta put it here to the y hat, right? Let's do that vectorially. So you get used to the notation when we go to a more difficult type of problem. This one here. Okay, here is gonna be one hundred twenty knots. Right? And now you got the velocity of the airplane with respect to the ground. I'm gonna put it here. What do we get? 150, right? sense and then you can have the other way you can have headwinds right and then you get less you get 90 knots okay and then you have the more difficult type of problem the more difficult type of problem is the one in which the wind we go we have the ground station here differential a the wind is blowing at an angle you know either a right angle or you know or a different angle that's a more difficult problem okay and next time you go to the beach pay attention to how the seagulls fly over the shore okay have you ever noticed that anything strange about how the seagulls fly 
the wind is blowing from the the breeze is blowing from the sea and the sea goes there you know for some reason the seagulls like to fly in a straight line parallel to the sea for some reason i don't know why they, they like to do that you know you rarely see them flying towards the sea or away from the sea have you ever any anybody has noticed that what happened the sea is this side from the right side i'm, I'm a seagull i'm flying right? The wind is blowing. What's going to happen if I, if I don't do any correction to my cat? I'm going to blow away from the sea, right? Mm -hmm. So how do the seagulls correct for that? Like I said, the seagulls are like flying this straight line, probably of the sea. How do they do? They fly like that. Okay? Are you noticing that? So they know relative velocity. You didn't take my point, but they don't run these right? <laughs> okay. It's not that. I guess physics are right there in their, in their DNA. After millions of years of evolution, right? So, the same thing happens to airplanes. The same thing happens to the airplane. If you want to fly towards the north... Oh, no, here, right? This one here. If you want to fly towards the north, the only way you will accomplish that is by crabbing into the wind. Okay? I learned that in the hard way when I, when I started learning how to fly. You know, it's uh, sort of scary, right? First time, first time I, I, I went, I hopped into the airplane with my instructor. I didn't do my homework, even though I was a graduate student at the time. I was supposed to know you know, relative velocity, but I didn't do my homework. I hopped in the airplane to the air to, with the instructor, and for some reason the instructor apparently was not very experienced because he decided to fly with me whenever we had a strong crosswind in the in the airport. Okay, so we we are coming for a landing, and the landing is the most uh, dangerous moment of of a flight okay and uh, I was sitting on the pilot left side my instructor was sitting on the right side and he took over the controls right and what did he do the wind is coming to the left he banked the airplane to the right to the left like that right and then I saw the runaway going this way relative motion right I was initially you know, sitting like, like that. Once it banks to the left, now I'm no longer sitting upright. Now I'm sitting like that. And the runaway, of course, seemed to go the other way, right? And then I start thinking, why he's doing that? Why is he doing that, right? And then I start to become a little bit nervous. And then I yank on the controls and straight up the plane. <laughs> and then he screamed at me, who is the pilot in command here, me or you? Right? <laughs> And then, okay, you can, can finish flying. And then he went, went ahead, he banked the airplane. After the airplane banked, the air, airplane corrects its attitude with respect to the wind and start to descend to the runaway in a crab position. Can you picture that? Just like the seagull in the, in the shore, right? And then when you touch down the, on, the, on the runaway, the, the left gear touch first, he is straight up the attitude of the airplane, and then as the airplane slows down, the other one touches down nicely in the runaway. All to do, that's all to do is relative motion. That was the day that I really learned about relative motion. That was the day that I really learned about relative velocity, because I practiced that in the airplane. I could have killed my, my instructor in me, right? But I learned, right? And then we left the airplane and he came to me and said, no, don't do that in the, in the final. We're in the final here, don't do that. Okay. Oh, no. oh, yes, now I understand why. At that very moment that I was talking to him after we left the airplane, at that very moment, I finally understood the concept of relative velocity. Because I was practicing it in real life. Okay? I was practicing it. it it's not enough to do what we're doing here. If you really want to learn that, you've got to do it. That's why we have labs that are upstairs. We don't have every lab experiment that you can absorb and learn it, but we have some that will, will help you, okay? 
And later on, when you get a good job, you'll be able to do those things that I did in the past too, okay? And you really learn better about uh, uh, relative velocity. So let's solve this problem. Now let's see, we have 15 minutes. Any, any more questions? Running out here of time. Can you where you find where, when? Cessna? Yeah, it's small Cessna. No. Yeah, which was there at Langley Air Force Base. When I, I used to work at NASA, right? NASA's next to Langley Air Force Base. They used to fly the those those jets and the and the an invisible plane there at Langley. We could see. this is a huge runway that we have there at Langley. It's a huge runway. It's incredible. You know, I would see some airplanes. Well, one day I was sitting there in the runway with my instructor, and there was a jet, a fighter jet, that lost they lost its brakes, the hydraulics. So it's an emergency situation, right? So what do they do? They do exactly what they do in the carriers, right? They deploy a cable across the runaway. The airplane doesn't have any brakes, right? And the, the cable is across the runaway. The cable is going to catch on the airplane and it's going to slow down the airplane. Make sense? Right? And then my instructor telling me, look, they're going to... That the airplane lost the hydraulics, doesn't have any brakes, and they're going to slow down with the cable. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> An emergency, right? In F S-15 at that time. I would see all that stuff in there, every now and then. And then there was some crazy aerobatic pilots, too, that would do, do some, you know, aerobatic maneuvers there in the, above the runaway. Interesting times. Okay, so let's do the, this other one now. Uh, 30 knots, let's do 30 knots as well. Yeah, okay, an airplane is flying north, uh, their speed indicator of the airplane, and let's put 120 knots, a ground station has measured the wind at the altitude, with a meteorological balloon, it has reported that the wind is blowing not north, but blowing towards, okay, towards the west, from east to west, no, no, from west to east. To east. Let's, let's do to east because that one. Yes, yeah, going towards the east. Okay. At the speed of 30 knots, what is the ground speed of the airplane? That's the first question. A. What's the ground speed of the airplane? And then there's a second question. B. What is the attitude of the airplane? With respect to its path, to its ground path. See what you see here? Here's the attitude of the airplane, right? There is altitude and there is attitude. Right? The orientation of the airplane. It can be you know nose down, nose high, or it can be left or right. That's what attitude is all about. Just like your seagull, right? Your seagull had the a di uh, different attitude when they fly over the the shore. Okay, what's the ground speed of the airplane? Okay, don't forget those relations here. Okay, so here's the equation. Okay, velocity of the airplane with respect to the ground. Okay, I do not know the speed, but I know the direction the airplane is flying, right? So here you go. Let's get it. This one. The direction the airplane is flying is towards the north or in the y hat direction. Okay, the velocity of the airplane with respect to the wind. Let's see. 
is going to be a, what's the ground speed of the airplane? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave this way, but I know that the, the velocity of the wind with respect, I'll leave this one right now. I know the velocity, oh, this one here. Uh, put it copy and paste. And then I got a 30 knots, but 30 knots towards what? Towards X, right? I know, hey, wait a minute. I know the magnitude, but I do not know the direction, okay? See, I know the airspeed, but I do not know the orientation of the airplane with respect to the wind. Make sense? So here you go. I'm going to put it here. Magnitude is 120 knots. Right? But then I do not know. See, see the difference here? Here, I do not know the magnitude, but I know the direction. Here, I know the direction, but I, do, uh, I know the magnitude, but I do not know the direction. See the difference? So here you go. We are going to... Put a parenthesis here. Why hat? Uh, let's see here. I have what I have to do. Let's see here. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay, the way you do it is like that. I gotta put a cosine of theta here. Okay, I have to put a cosine of theta, right? Here you go. Like that, right? There's a theta here. Suppose that's an angle theta. Right, in the case of uh, the x should be cosine, cosine of theta, this, this, this vector should be a unit vector, by the way, mm, functions, 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 getting, do you see the functions here, no? Yeah, I gotta go from. Oh, yeah, I found the function finally. <laughs> That's okay. Theta. Theta. Okay. And by the way, for this specific problem, I know that the airplane is point, has to point to the left, so it should be a negative x, right? A negative x hat. You gotta do this analysis. And the order is going to be sine thirty knots. Okay. Now we have a vectorial equation here. Do you see how it's far more difficult than the other one, right? In the one-dimensional one, right? So, so we're going to combine the x direction in terms of the x direction How many equations do you have here? How many scalar equations do you have here? Huh? How many scalar equations do we have here? I have to put 120 here as well. Huh? 
What did I do? We have one vectorial equation, but how many scalar equations do we have? Huh? Two, right? How many unknowns do we have? I'm going to highlight the unknown here for you. This is one unknown. Yeah? This is another unknown, right? This is repeated here. Can you solve this problem? Yes or no? Can you solve this problem? Two equations, two unknowns. Can you solve this problem? Let me break that down with you. Let's see what time is that, 6.40. I'll let you finish that. I'm not going to finish. Uh, that's one equation. And that's the other equation. I don't think I made any mistake. Sometimes we make, you know. But I don't think I made a mistake here in this one. If you find a mistake, let me know, okay? I can take it out. Go. Go. Okay. This equation, here you go. Here's the x component and here's the y component. This equation tells you the angle tells you the attitude of the airplane or the attitude of your seagull this other equation here once you plug the angle right here you are going to find out the ground speed okay so any questions let me save it So I'm going to stop the recording now before it gets too, too large.